Well, it is spring, and even though it's only the first day, you can already see new signs of life, warmer days. Garden centers are getting busy. People have packets of seeds ready to plant, or maybe they've already planted them in little pots for seedlings to put in the earth when it gets warm. <clears throat> One thing we know for sure is that if those seeds are left in a package on the kitchen counter, they'll never be more than the pretty picture that's on the package. And Jesus, in his parable today, makes that very point, that unless a seed is placed in the earth, it will never produce new life. It will remain dead, a dry seed, not thriving or flourishing with the potential for new life, the life it was intended to have. As it turns out, this is also Passion Sunday in the season of Lent, the fifth week of Lent, and the scriptures turn to or begin to focus on Christ's passion. And in this parable, Jesus makes that connection between his own death and the new resurrected life. So Jesus is in Jerusalem. It's crowded, chaotic, Passover festival. And he knows that everything in his life and ministry has brought him to what he calls this hour. Along the way, he has grieved over the lost sheep of Israel to whom he was sent. He has wept over Jerusalem. He's come into Jerusalem hailed as a king. But in spite of all this, Jesus knows that his public ministry in Israel is over. There's no question in his mind about where things go from here. So when Philip and Andrew come to tell him there are some Greeks who want to see him, he simply says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. He seems to be saying, now is not the time or this is not a good time, or maybe even it's too late. They're too late. But then he goes on to tell this simple parable about a single seed dying, being buried, and bursting forth as a new and thriving plant of many seeds, all with the potential for even more new growth. As Jesus tells this parable, he knows that he's the seed. And of course, he's talking about his own death and resurrection that will bear the fruit of a new creation. And he will be the first to die and rise again. And his followers, those dedicated to serving and sacrificing their lives for him, will be expected to follow him into this new and resurrected life. He said, it says in verse 26, Jesus says, Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Serve me, follow me as my servant and my Father will honor the one who serves me. So they will need to surrender their attachments to the world. Ambitions and ideas, illusions of glory that seem more important than he is to them. And in this penitential season, such as Lent, I think, at least for myself,
and many others, we, we actually come face to face with the grip the world has on us. Or even worse, how we ourselves cling to the world with all its false hopes. The world that lets us think we control our own destiny. These are illusions, of course. And if we're willing to surrender those illusions of control to Jesus, then something new can grow. Jesus knows his own honor and glory are intertwined with his death and resurrection. And he now points out that our honor comes by following him. Our real life, our true honor, comes through loving and serving Christ. And we will follow him into the glory of his kingdom. However, even as he says all this, even as he talks to them about surrendering to God's will, he himself knows how difficult that is. And it's here in John's Gospel that we begin to get a sense of the agony he feels in his own walk to the cross. In verse 27, he says, Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify my name. So Jesus understands what he's asking his followers to do. As troubled as he is by what lies ahead for him, and he is deeply troubled, he's able to follow through. He understands completely what's expected of him. Jesus can carry on because he knows who he is, why he's here, he has a clear conviction of his purpose, his mission of salvation. But also, he is passionately and faithfully committed to laying aside his own will in obedience to his Father. Jesus knows that glory and, the glory and honor he left behind with the Father is being restored through his obedience. N.T. Wright calls this parable Jesus tells us, and I'll quote, one of the powerful gospel pictures John gives us for our own prayer, devotion, and service. It is a powerful image. John's gospel is about painting pictures of who Jesus is. And this is, for our sakes, one of the most powerful. It shows us Jesus' commitment, his faithfulness, his prayer life. And it's intended to show us what we need in our own lives to keep going forward. It's a powerful reminder that our honor is found not in any worldly thing, but in honoring and serving Christ. The Father honors our efforts to put to death the old self, to bury it so that our new life in Christ and for Christ can spring up to serve him. To be honored is to be cherished and treasured. And what greater honor is there than to be honored by God the way he honors his son. The best honor we can receive comes when we surrender ourselves to the abundant new life we have received in Christ, a life we already have, a life dedicated to his service and friendship. That's what he offers. That's what we receive. And just as Jesus knows who he is, 
we must remember who we are in Christ. Just as he understands his purpose and his mission, our own understanding is key to following him. So if we go back to these Greeks who approached Jesus at the beginning of our reading, you notice that Jesus neither receives them nor rejects them. And it's quite possible he's not surprised to see them. Because just as Jesus knows his mission to Israel, he knows it's not for Israel alone. But this is not the time for him to engage with them. At the end of our reading, he says, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. So, these Greeks represent all people. And this defines our purpose our mission. Our responsibility as Christians is to lift Jesus up to the world. And often we'll be doing this in our everyday lives without even knowing it. The things we say, the things we think, the way we treat the people around us. These little things mustn't be discounted. They reflect our attitudes to Jesus and to others. I do believe, and I was thinking about it this week, that when we emerge from this pandemic, there will be a need for rebuilding and healing in many ways, as there always is after a crisis such as this. And we have a responsibility to help, and we'll have abundant opportunities to be available to listen to support people in prayer and other ways, to support the healing of relationships, families, even communities. In some ways, this pandemic, which as it happened, began last year in Lent, has become a very long Lent of its own. And we will emerge changed. Jesus tells us in this parable today, the old is buried, it's gone, but not in a hopeless way. It's the seed that gives birth to a new and abundant life. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word to us today. We thank you that Jesus has gone before us to show the way and he graciously calls us to follow him. So continue to encourage us and strengthen us that we may be honor him in our ways and in our lives. We ask this in his faithful name. Amen. <laughs>